Hello everyone. We are back once again with Golf Cart Garage. I am Tim. I'm a technician here with Golf Cart Garage. This is our weekly Q&A session where we go over some of the questions that we get every week here at Golf Cart Garage. We try to answer some emails, try to answer any questions that we've gotten throughout the week, try to save some people some money. We get tons and tons of questions about golf carts, as you may realize by now. Uh, we are live. This is Thursday the 24th. We are live on Facebook and YouTube right now at the same time. Uh, if anybody's watching in, the, in Facebook or YouTube, type in what kind of golf cart you have in the chat window. Uh, where are you from? Just type in something in the chat window and I'll talk about it when I get over there to, to, to look at that. Let's see. The garage is now open, so let's get started. We'll go with question number one. Let's see what we got. This is from Kelly. I have a 48 volt easy go, new standard batteries, test at 50.5 volts, hook up charger and test again at 53.5 volts after five minutes, retest uh, 59.5 volts, smell battery venting and remove charger. Think charger relay is stuck. Your thoughts please. Okay, Kelly, um, this is what the this is what my first reaction would be on a 48 volt battery system 48 volt battery system toward the end of the charge cycle like uh when when you your charger is getting ready to shut off you could see over 60 volts easily you could see 61 even 62 volts somewhere in that area so 59.5 should not be shocking now that would be the time that you would smell the, the batteries venting. So that could also be normal. If you wanted to be sure, you know, about your, if you're, if you're concerned, I don't think you should be concerned. I think you should let the charger go and see if it shuts off. And if it does, everything's fine. You could try it on another cart and see if it does the same thing also, see if it shuts off before that. But 60 volts or some or more, that would not be unusual at all for the charger to still be running right there, but it's getting ready to shut off. And like I said, the venting and the smell could be normal also. So I wouldn't be too, I wouldn't be too alarmed, you know, at, at this situation until you let the charger go and let it do its thing first. Let's see. Number two. I have a 2017 EasyGo RXV 4 battery 48 volt cart. The original batteries are failing. Can you do a segment on what it really takes to convert to lithium batteries? I see all kinds of amperage claims and some say you need a new charger. Tell it to me straight. It would be nice to see it done. Well, I like how you say tell it to me straight because that's what I do. Uh, the, the answer to your question is Every, there, there's a lot of lithium manufacturers out there now for golf carts. Every one of the manufacturers have their own set of rules on how they want you to charge their particular batteries. We only sell Allied here at, at a Golf Cart Garage at this time. Now, Allied does it a little different than, than some of the other manufacturers. Some of the other manufacturers, they give you one battery. Like, let's just, let's just say that you have a 48 volt car. Uh, you get one 48 volt battery from them. It's a big one. You know, it's a 148 volt battery and you just hook up your first positive lead and your last negative to the positive and negative. That's all it's got. And they may or may not recommend using their charger. Now, if it was me, I would, if the, if the uh, lithium company is recommending using their charger, I would use their charger. This is way too expensive of an investment to risk something being wrong with your charger and damaging a $3,000, $2,000 lithium battery pack. So if, it's, if they say they would recommend using their charger, I would do so. Now, Allied does it a little bit different. Allied can sell you one small 48 volt battery, and then you hook a second one up in parallel, or even a third one up in parallel, and every time you do that, it doubles your amp hour. Amp hour, like I've said before, amp hour is directly related to the distance that your golf cart can travel before it needs recharging. So. If you only need to go 15 miles, you never need to go over 15 miles, then you could get maybe just two or three of those. But if you needed to go further than 15 miles, you can go as far as you want. The question is, is how far do you need to drive your cart? And, and it can be done. That's the way Allied does it. They, they, you just connect them in parallel rather than in a series. Like a regular golf cart has six batteries or four batteries. They're connected in series, which is positive, negative, positive, negative. Well, 
parallel connection is positive positive negative negative and what that does is that increases the amp hour doubles the amp hour which doubles the distance the voltage does not increase the amp hour increases and that doubles the distance so I hope I gave it to you straight enough there let's see here number three this is from Joseph I have a 92 club car 36 volt electric car with new batteries and cables effective August 2021. During our cold spell, 50 degrees overnight, during the past several weeks, the golf cart would not engage with the key on in either drive position. However, after it warmed up, the cart reverted to normal operation. Well, if you are, if you are convinced that the colder temperatures have something to do with it, then that would lead me to believe that you have a micro switch sticking. Like, uh, you know, switches, they have a little bit of oil in them, like uh, when they're made, they're, they're, they're made really, really smooth. So if, it's, if it, the cold temperature is affecting a micro switch, then it could be sticking. And as soon as it warms up, it, it you know, it, it releases itself. So. You need to you need to tell me if your solenoid is clicking. Like it, even when the cart fails to engage, and you, but when you touch the gas pedal, does the solenoid click? If it doesn't, that's going to be what I said about the micro switch. Most likely. All right, let's go to number four here. This is from Wayne T. After a full charge, cart runs fine for a while, five minutes, and then starts to slow down. Batteries are 37 volts at start and 36 volts when slowing down. Sometimes the cart just stops after 15 minutes. It still appears to have a full charge. Our thought is there is a bad battery that fails under load. Well, Wayne, that would be my thought exactly. Uh, so that's what I would be testing for first. And you may have heard me say this before about how to do that with a, with a voltmeter with a alligator leads you know that you can clip to your batteries what you're going to want to do is clip your leads to one of your batteries turn it on bring it up in the seat with you and drive the cart you know and especially drive the cart uh, to failure because that's going to give you the best indication of what if you have a battery falling out or not so drive it to failure because you should see and you're going to do this test six times or four times depending on how many batteries you have uh, if you do have a battery dropping out you'll see it You'll see it on the voltmeter because you'll start out at, at 12 volts and it'll drop down to like six or something like that. Or if you'll if you start if you have eight volt batteries in your car or six volts batteries in your car, it'll start out at six or eight volts and then it'll just drop down to like two or something like that. Like where the other ones would hold their voltage a lot better than one of them. Batteries never fail at the same time. When you have a bunch of batteries hooked in series, they're never going to fail at the same time. That's that would be very highly unlikely. One of them's always going to fail first. So you're probably on the right track that you have a battery failing under load. Okay. Number five, this is from Roger. Just purchased a 2003 48 volt turf carry-all from a local company. They were using it in a warehouse setting. It seems to be set for lower speed. I need to know if there are settings for different application. If so, how do I change the settings? Okay, in, in 2003, a carry-all could have two electrical systems. So my first question would be, uh, does it have a run toe switch, toggle switch under the seat? If it does, then it could be adjusted by a club car with their computer. They have a little computer, diagnostic computer, that they plug in and then they can adjust. You can see what speed it's set on or what setting. There's like four settings there that they, that they could pick from. And if you, you might be on, you, you might be correct. It might be set on a slow setting. Your controller might be on the slow setting. So they could check that and then they could adjust it for you and put it on a higher setting. Now they're going to charge you to do that. You know, but that, that would be one way you could do it if you have a run toe switch. If you don't have a run toe switch, if it's the series type electrical system, then 
you could, your M core could be slowing you down. You know, over time, the the, the linkages going to the M core can wear out and not quite go wide open. So it could be your M core, or you could just buy a higher speed motor. You know, or one of the combo kits that we sell at Golf Cart Garage. Uh, you can go as you know, get it up as fast as you need to go, like that, if you wanted to go that route. Let's see, number six. This is from Patty. We bought our golf cart and there are no keys for the dashboard locks. I was wondering if she could install new locks herself or just get two new keys. Well, if you knew the, if you knew where the dashboard manufacturer was or where the dashboard came from, I'm sure you could contact them and you could just get two new keys. You'd have to know where your dashboard came from though. Uh, now, also, as far as the locks go, I would think that, yeah, you could, you could put new locks. You, you know, take those locks to the store and find something exactly the, the same uh, hole size, you know, that, so it would fit in your, your dash covers. And uh, you could do it that way too. So yeah, you could do it either way. All right, let's see. Number seven, will this work on my Yamaha drive? I converted it to a 48 volt lithium, Star EV 600 amp, Navitas DC to AC conversion kit with on the fly programmer. This is from Robin. Okay, you understand that Navitas makes a system for the Yamaha drive, so I'm not sure why you're asking me could you put one for, that's for a star? Like a star is a whole nother car. It's a star EV. That's, that's a whole nother type of golf car. But Navitas does make one for your car, an, uh, the same system uh, with on the fly programmer and everything. So I wouldn't recommend trying to use one for a star. I would, I would get the one for the Yamaha Drive. Number, number eight. This is from Rotor. Will this fit? 2004 Easy Go with PMV part number. Uh, it's a Curtis Controller 350 amp series for Easy Go TXT Medalist 94 and up. 2004. As the answer to your question is, as long as your uh, your cart does not have a run tow switch under the seat. That means we need to make sure that your cart is a series cart because that controller is for a series electrical system. So yes, it would it, as long as your cart is a is a Easy Go TXT series with no run toe switch, and yeah, that, then that then that would be fine. Let's see number nine. This is from Ken. I have installed a Rock six inch lift on my Yamaha G22, and I need a longer choke cable. What do you recommend? What happens sometimes in certain cars, it's not all of them, certain gas cars we're talking about. When you install a lift kit on certain gas cars, certain models, and certain types of lift kits, what they do is that, you know, the motor, when you're sitting there, when the golf cart is sitting there, your motor is at a certain angle. When you install a lift kit, you raise uh, that section and the motor can go can change angles just just a little bit can go can slightly change the angle because of the lift kit that can affect that can affect certain things that can affect uh, some of your cables may a little bit may, may become a little tight uh, might I, I can understand why you possibly have a short choke cable now or a little bit short uh, also I've, I've heard some people that they actually have to reduce the oil that they put in because the motor is tilted a little bit so it changes where the oil is sitting and it and it's completely different on the dipstick so it, they end up having too much oil in there because of where the oil is sitting in the engine now so you have to reduce the amount of oil sometimes now as far as the longer choke cable goes i'm sure that you could probably look around you know take a measurement of yours because a choke cable is a very simple cable it's very common the way that they work a uh, very common hookup on both ends, you know, or, or the pull thing on one end and then the little hookup on the other end. And all you're doing is you actually have to move this little flap over the carburetor in order to choke it. So I'm sure that you could look around and probably find, take a measurement of yours, find one a little bit longer if you wanted to. Uh, 
I don't know of one run off hand, but you might have to do some experimentation or some research and look around. I tell you what I have seen. I have seen on uh, Amazon, they have a, some common things called a throttle extension, throttle cable extension. Those seem to be more common than a choke cable extension. Uh, you might find a throttle cable extension that might help you. Or, depending on how much you need, it may be as simple as you're just getting a little piece of metal and making an extension yourself. I mean, that's probably what I would do. I'd probably look at what I need and maybe just try to extend it one inch. Because I'm assuming that you don't need to go real far. You just need to go a little bit longer because your cable, your motor tilted and it's a little bit further away than it was before. So you might want to just consider making one yourself, just a little small one. Since it's not a real complicated device is why I was saying that. Okay, let's see. Number 10. I have a 96 club car with an onboard computer. If I want to change my batteries, 48 volt to lithium, what do I need to do regarding a new charger? Existing as a power drive and the OVC. Well, one of the previous questions, we talked about this a little bit. Now, what we sell at Golf Cart Garage is the Allied brand of lithium batteries. And I can tell you this, Allied does recocommend using their own charger. They, they have an allied charger, you know, for your specific, specific uh, configuration, in your case, 48 volts. Allied does recommend using their own charger, you know, for your system. Now, so it would be up to which battery manufacturer you used. Always check with them because they're all very specific on, the, on their certain recommendations to take care of their battery pack. And you want to follow those recommendations because you don't want to mess up an expensive battery pack like that. Okay, let's see, number 11. I have a Polaris gym car, three passenger. It is a 72 volt system. I want to convert the batteries to lithium. What is your recommendation? Thanks. Well, uh, if you are, I mean, what do you, I mean, we sell Allied here at Golf Cart Garage. And my recommendation for that would be Allied sells. They sell a single 72 volt battery and it's small. It's a small 72 volt battery, so you're going to want to use more than one. Uh, I have read some reviews on people with 72 volt systems. They have used three and four of those, just depending on how much range you need. If you don't need, if you're not really worried about more range than you were getting before, just get three of them. Get three of the 72 volt batteries and put them in series. I mean, I'm sorry, in parallel, and that will triple the distance of just one. That's probably would be plenty for you. That's probably going to be more range than your other battery pack was giving you anyway. But if not, you can come back within one year and still add an Allied battery and even get more range. You could go to four of them and so on and so on. You got six slots, so you, you, you're you not going to need all six. Uh, but you might four or five Allied 72 volts would probably do be plenty for you. Number 12. I have no spark. What could cause this? Well, uh, the I could make a joke, but I'm not. So it could be coal, igniter, and a plug, or a spark plug. That would be the three things that I would check on first for, for no spark. Uh, after that, you know, We'd uh, have to look at some other stuff, but it would be your coil slash igniter, which is whatever your spark plug wire is, is comes from, that's going to be your coil slash igniter, and then your spark plug itself. And make sure you've got good connection in the plug and the wire, too. So uh, that would be the common things that would cause no spark. Let's see. Number 13. This is from Chuck. I'm removing the rear seat on my 2014 precedent. What hardware do I need to convert it back to a two passenger with basket and golf bag holders? Thank you. Well, that question usually is the other direction. You know, it's that this is a, the opposite direction of where people normally do. Normally they want to know what they need to do to convert their car to a four passenger kit. Well, you're actually trying to remove it and convert it back to stock. Well, you could obviously, you could look up all those parts or get somebody at Golf Cart Garage to help you look up the part numbers and, and, and buy all those parts brand new to put it back like it was. But honestly, if I was you, 
golf cart shops have been installing four passenger kits you know they do it every day so they probably have a pile of that equipment that you're talking about laying in the corner somewhere just piling up that maybe even get thrown away because they don't need those parts anymore so i would call all your local golf cart shops in your area and pose that question to them you may find some that they'll give you because they're there's going they're going to be really common from all the four passenger kits that have been installed over time This is number 14. I have a 2004 club car precedent. It has been modified and is great. New batteries put in two and a half years ago. The last two times I used the car, it would lose power and die after about 15 holes. I've been pretty good about keeping batteries tended with water. Nothing visible wrong with batteries. Is there anything to do or do I have to buy a whole new battery pack? Uh, I wouldn't think you would need to buy a whole new battery pack at two and a half years. That's, that'd be kind of unusual. That's pretty quick. Uh, if you did, then I wouldn't get that brand of battery, whatever that brand of battery was anymore. Uh, the, what you need to do is you need to get a proper load test done on your, on your battery pack. You can either get a golf cart shop to do that for you, or you can do the, what I talked about earlier in this video where you, you do a voltmeter, especially at the point of failure, you know, right before failure, like make the cart fail and then usually if it's a battery issue and the cart fails if you'll just wait a few minutes it'll roll again you know it'll roll some and then it'll fail in a very short period of time then and then you just stop and wait and it'll roll a little bit more well that's the best time to do this test because you're trying to find out which battery is dropping out because like i was saying earlier they don't all drop out at the same time never it's always one's going to drop out first so you either need to take your cart to a golf cart shop and let them do a discharge test on it they have a discharge machine that will discharge your battery pack as a whole unit. It treats it as one battery and then pulls all the juice out of it. And depending on how much time it takes to pull all the juice out of it, they can give you a very accurate, the most accurate idea of how good your battery pack is as a whole. Now, if you don't want to do that, then you're going to have to do the voltmeter thing on each individual battery, you know, while you're driving the car and watch for the voltage to just drop out on one of your batteries. Okay, let's see, number 15. Hi Tim, is it cheaper to rebuild an old club car that has been sitting in my garage for a decade or two, or buy a new one? Last time it ran, I had put a cheap eBay car on it and it ran fine for a couple of months, but it since sat, which was in early 2010. Well, I, I guess it really just depends on if you want a project or not, because anything, any gas car that's been sitting that long uh, and not, not used, you're going to have uh, uh, every issue imaginable in the fuel system alone, like the, the gas tank is going to need completely cleaning out, the pickup line in the gas tank, the fuel hose going to the fuel pump, the fuel pump itself the fuel hose is coming from the fuel pump to the carburetor, the carburetor itself. Every one of those things held gas for that long. You know, there was still gas in there, so they're all gonna be gummed up and they're all, none of that's gonna work. So you'd have to sort out your fuel, the entire fuel system first. So, you know, I'm not saying it's not, that it's not possible. Sure, it's possible. You could probably do that, clean all that stuff out or replace the fuel pump and replace the fuel lines and all that, the carburetor again. You could probably get it running again if that was the only thing that was wrong with it when it was parked. Uh, you know, make sure you put oil in it. If we're talking about a four stroke, make sure you ch try to get that oil out and see what it looked like because it might be difficult to get all of it out if it's been sitting for that long. You may have to change your oil a couple of times. If it's a two stroke, probably uh, you just need to make sure the thing's not locked up, you know, because uh, that's be a whole different story. Okay, let's see. Number 16. This is from John. I have a 2014 RXV Freedom Cart. It's starting to act like it is stalling when I'm driving forward and especially on hills. I was told it was my electric brake, so I changed it with no change in the stalling. Sometimes it almost feels like it is trying to shift into reverse. What is the problem and how should I fix it? Well, 
Well, if you hadn't told me that you changed the electric brake, that's where I was going to go. I was going to say, you know, I've, I've heard of electric brake issues that, uh, that these symptoms are very, very similar to, to what you're describing. I've seen those symptoms. Uh, and we sell a lot of electric brakes. So uh, apparently that's, you know, parts not bulletproof. Uh, they do go out. So that's where I was going to go. But since you, uh, since the electric brake has been changed, it kind of makes it unlikely that it's the electric brake. So I would check all your battery connections and check your batteries. Make sure you don't have a battery that's kind of dropping and coming back in, you know, while you're driving it. And, uh, and other than that, if it's not a battery issue, then it's probably going to be a controller issue, which I know that's not good news, but that's probably where I would go next if it wasn't a battery issue. Let's see, number 17. I have a problem with my golf cart. I have two carbs that I got from you. Runs good for a while, then they flood out with gas pouring out. I know about float sticking. Do you have any idea what is causing this? Gas going into my oil. I remember speaking with this uh, gentleman about this issue earlier this week. The, the way that gas gets into your oil, you know, in a carbureted motor, in a carbureted, these small carbureted engines on golf carts, is that gas continues to pump after the needle and seat are supposed to be closed. All right, the, 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 when you let off the gas pedal, the needle and seat is supposed to be completely closed. If they are completely closed, then no more gas gets past the carburetor. So it's either that, it's either the needle and seat that's allowing gas to continue to go past the carburetor and dump into your cylinder when your foot's off the gas pedal because if your foot was on the gas pedal the cylinder would be firing and it would burn up that gas so if you're getting gas in your oil this is happening when your foot's off of the gas pedal all right that being said if your foot's off the gas pedal there's no spark going on but if your butterfly valve is still open just a little bit then gas can still flow because it thinks your butterfly you know your butterfly valve is the valve that twist when you press the gas pedal. So if it's still open just a little bit, gas can still go past. So you need to make sure that you, when you let off the gas pedal, that your butterfly valve, the gas throttle valve, is completely closed. So uh, otherwise it might, somehow it's leaking past there. That's, I mean, we, we, we talked about that for about 20, 30 minutes on the phone and that's the only thing we could think of is that he still hadn't figured out exactly why the gas is getting past the carburetor. Something's not sealing off, either the butterfly valve or the needle and seat. Okay, let's see, number 18. This is from Sam. Hello, I bought a 1989 G2E, which would be electric, recently and finally have it cruising the neighborhood. Problem is it is slow. It has six new batteries and all the wires are clean and correct. Siri has clocked us at 14 miles an hour max. What can I do to speed this grocery getter up? Thanks for your help. Well, in 1989, I mean, it, Normally, even to this day, you know, most golf carts are, uh, they were, they ended up on a golf course. You know, uh, the majority of golf course, uh, golf carts out there, they spend the first three or four years of their life on a golf course. Well, golf courses have speed limits. They do. They have speed limits. They do not want a fleet full of really fast golf cars out there with a bunch of men playing golf. Uh, that can lead to some good times. I mean, that can lead to some trouble because they end up playing bumper cars and racing and stuff. But anyway, stock golf course speed is generally about 12 to 14 miles an hour. So I wouldn't say that. I think it's very likely that there's nothing wrong with your car. It, that's probably just how fast it goes. If you're already hitting 14, I would say 12 to 14 would be uh, stock golf course speed. And, the, and the, that fleet, whatever fleet that G2 was in it, that's what they were set at uh, if they're even adjustable that your car might not even be adjustable so if everything is working correctly and 14 is normal you only have a couple of choices you can change the controller you can get a combo kit you could put a high-speed motor in it there, there's uh, you can put high-speed gears in it 
if you got plenty of power, you know, you, if your only complaint is top end speed and you have plenty of power, plenty of torque to climb your hills in your neighborhood or wherever you're at, then put high speed gears in it. That'll solve your problem right there. Let's see, number 19. This is from Richard. When I bought my 2009 club car precedent, it came with a new 24 miles per hour motor, which was a $640 add-on, and the car was really fast. After replacing the controller with the 350 amp and adding new Trojan batteries, the car doesn't reach the original speed. Other than replacing the motor with a new higher speed model, is there anything else that I might do to get it back to the original operation? Okay, uh, that car has is programmable. By I talked about the club car computer earlier. That there's a diagnostic port on your car that the club car computer plugs into, and they can change some settings in there. They can change your regenerative braking settings. They can change your some of your speed settings in there. So, what you did when you changed the controller is you got rid of whatever speed setting was in your original controller. And you put in a new controller, not knowing what the speed what the speed setting was set on it. So I would say that you might need to get your controller programmed, and you might that might solve your issue. It might not be in the same setting as your old controller was in that you replaced. I understand that you replaced it with a higher amp controller, but amps does not make your car go faster. Amps makes your car quicker. That's uh, something a lot of people don't realize. Voltage will make your car go faster, but amps makes your car more powerful. It, you know, from here, to your 60 foot time would be would be better. It, you know, if you, when you increase your amps, uh, but so it's not surprising to me that your car is not any faster. But it, the fact that it is slower makes me think that it's something to do with your controller that you put in there and needs to be reprogrammed. Okay, let's see. We're gonna. That was it for the questions. That was all the questions for today. Let me look at Facebook and YouTube, see what's going on there. See if anybody's there. Here on Facebook, I have a Linda Mundy. We have a Tomberlin. Can't keep brakes up. Can't keep brakes up. I don't think I really understand your question. We have a Tomberlin. Can't keep brakes up. Sorry, Linda. I don't, I don't understand your question. See if you can give me a little more information on that. Uh, I'll come back to you. So Tom Peters got a 99 Easy Go TXT. Trouble getting motor out. Tried prying, banging, still nothing. I, I, I've seen that before, Tom. It's uh, it can be really frustrating. Uh, sometimes those, you know, the motor coupling is on a splined shaft. The input shaft is splined, and then the motor coupling is splined. And if somebody didn't put when they installed it. If they didn't put just a little dab of grease inside there, they, they can get they can get frozen up. So you've got to, you're doing the right thing. You just got to keep doing what you're doing, and you got to eventually like you got to figure out some kind of way to push that motor up and down and tilt it and go back and forth with it, and uh, eventually you can get a make enough space to where you can get a screwdriver in between there maybe and be careful and. It's it's a there's no easy way to do it when when a motor is stuck like that. So uh, good luck with that because it's it it can be difficult. Let me go over to Facebook. Let's see. Not seeing anybody on Facebook. All right. Well, it looks like it's about it. I'll check one more time before we leave. I uh, wanted to remind everyone that that uh, need to go to golfcartgarage.com and check out Extreme Golf Cart Makeover Season 2 with Dave. Dave is doing some cool stuff with an EasyGo TXT. There's more information at golfcartgarage.com. Look for this logo right here. Look for this logo, and you you can get more information about uh, prizes. They're going to be giving away prizes, so check that out. Also, wanted to remind everybody: 
if you feel like you need to speak to someone like myself about a golf cart issue, me or one of the other technicians, uh, click on the link in the description on this video. There's a link in the description that will take you to the Gearheads on Demand page of our website of golfcartgarage.com. It'll take you right to the scheduling page. And you can schedule a phone call with me where I just call you and we talk about whatever your issue is, or we can schedule a video session, or you can schedule a video session where I will send a link to your smartphone. And then all you do is click the link and then I can control your camera and I can see what you're pointing at and I can hear you talking and everything. And sometimes that helps. So remember that if you need to speak with me or a, a video session, click on the link in the description. I believe that's going to be it for me this week. So the garage is now closed. Thank you everybody for coming.